Let me just say, I have really enjoyed preaching this series on the code. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of the adage, all good things come to an end. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to miss preaching these one another's out of uh, the scriptures. Now, since this is the end of the one another's out of the book of Romans, I'll, I'll warn you now that sometime in the near future, if the Lord let me live, we're going to deal with some other one another's, perhaps in 1 John or 2 John or 3 John or some other book. But Paul often mentioned how we ought to deal with and how we ought to treat one another. Amen. And uh, so we, today we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. Last week we looked at verse 5 and 6. Today we're going to look at verse 7. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. And, and would you do me a favor today? W would you open your Bible and keep it open? Because I'm going to ask you to look with me at chapter 5, and I'm going to ask you to look at chapter 14. Uh, and it's going to be important for you to follow me as, as I argue Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Would you join me in reading this in unison? It says, accept one another, then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We're grateful, God, that you promised you would never leave us, nor would you forsake us. Promise, God, that you are the way, that you are the truth, and that you are the light. We are grateful, God, that you give us a pattern and give us an example of what we are to do. You give us, Lord, the road map for us to follow. And I pray, God, as your children, that we have learned how to be diligent at following your instructions. Reminded, oh God, how we get in our vehicles and the vehicle tells us to make a left in 3.1 miles, and in 3.1 miles we make a left that the, the vehicle tells us that we're going to make a right one-tenth of a mile and one-tenth of a mile. We follow the instructions. And when we follow the GPS's instructions, we get to where we were trying to go. And I believe, God, that when we learn how to follow your instructions, that you would help us to get to where we're trying to go. So help us, oh God, as we look at Romans chapter 15. Help us, God, to see what you are trying to say to us this day. Lord, we have ears, and we want to hear. We have eyes, and we want to see. We have hearts, oh God. We want to feel what you are saying to us collectively as your church on this morning. And we pray in the name that is above every name, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. All of us who love the Lord said amen. Amen. I, I love watching television as a child. And uh, from 1969 to 1974, there was a sitcom that, that we used to watch. We watched it much later than that because it, uh, it, it, it was on for all of our childhood years. It was called The Brady Bunch. And The Brady Bunch had one simple concept. There was a woman who had three daughters, and uh, they... They were by themselves. And then there was a man, the woman was named Carol, and she had three daughters, and the man was named Mike, and Mike had three sons. And uh, Carol met Mike, and Mike and Carol decided that she would bring her three children with his three sons, and together they became the Brady Bunch. And y'all are already singing it in your head. I don't want you to sing the song. I want you to listen to me in, in your sermon, in this sermon. Stop singing the song. Listen to me uh, in, 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 my, in my sermon. Uh, uh, and so all, almost every week as we watched the Brady Bunch, the Brady Bunch was really about them 
three, uh, those uh, four females, the, the mother and the three daughters and the husband with his three sons learning how to live together in a blended family. And so whether it was Greg who was the oldest boy or Marsha who was the oldest daughter or Jan and Peter and uh, Bobby and Cindy, it, it didn't really matter, all, all of them. Every scenario was them having issues with getting along with one another. Anybody remember watching the Brady Bunch? And uh, here's what I have come to, to recognize is that sometimes while we can see in other people's lives how they have challenges getting along, we can fail to see how we have challenges with getting along. Here's this huge family who has been thrown together because their parents fall in love with each other and uh, the children now have to deal with the circumstances of their parents. Because it wasn't their choice to become a family, it was the parents' choice to become this blended family and they now have the, the challenge of learning how to live together with one another. There are circumstances where large numbers of people come together where it too can be challenging to learn how to live together like the Brady Bunch. Some people struggle really hard with building new relationships. They have a hard time letting down their guard. In the physical, they don't have their guards up. But in the spirit realm, they got their guards up. And you cannot get close to them because they're guarded. Not guarded because of something you've done, guarded because of something someone else did, maybe as far as the 70s. Maybe they let their guard down in the 80s, and someone messed up on them. And they have made up their mind, I let my guard down with one person. And because they didn't handle me, allowing them to get close to me and letting down my guard, I don't know that I'm ever going to let my guard down for anyone else. You're going to have an opportunity to examine today how you approach relationships. I want you to realize today that I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm not talking to the person on the road behind you. Put your hand on your chest and say, he's talking to me. I'm talking to you. I'm going to preach about how to accept one another. How to accept one another. Because we're going to, in this text, we're going to see the what, the who, the how, and the why of accepting one another. When I'm done, you should have four things. You should have what, who, how, and why. You should have the answer to what it means to accept somebody. You should have the answer to why, to who, and to how to do all of that. Can I give you all the first point that I want you to get? And that is keep on accepting one another. It doesn't read that way, but when you read, accept one another in the, in the English, in, in the original language, it has the connotation of not doing it one time, but doing it continually. You are going to continue to accept one another. You're going to continue to move toward this place because in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 15, he says to them that you ought to be unified with one another, that there ought to be unity among you. And this unity among you, here's what it looks like, that you all have the same voice and you have the same heart. You're saying the same thing and you're thinking the same thing. And he's saying, since, and I know you saw this, when you get to verse 7, and there's right in the middle of verse 7, is then. He says, then accept one another. Accept one another then. What is the then connected to? It's connected to that we want to have unity. We want to be together with one another. And you cannot be together with a person that you won't accept. 
You cannot have unity when you are stiff arming a person. When you are holding a person at bay, when you are refusing to allow them to get close to you, you're not focused on unity. So there is the what of what we are to do, and, and that is that, that, that the Jews and the Gentiles, when Paul is writing, he's saying, you cannot continue to come together if you're going to come together as Jews and you're going to come together as Gentiles. There comes a point where you have to accept one another, and that means regardless of what your background is, I'm accepting you. The what is, you cannot be preoccupied with a person's background if you're going to accept them. If you're going to be in the same space, you cannot come to the same space playing as if you are the FBI. Uh, you, you can't be the one sniffing and looking and digging, trying to find dirt on folks if you're going to accept them. Uh, he, he's saying that, that you are to accept them. Now, it is, can I tell you what it is? It is to welcome a person, catch this, into your circle with no reservations. I'm not accepting you if I'm, I'm holding you outside of my circle. I'm going to deal with this later, uh, but some of us are having a struggle with this because we do not let people in. Yeah. Uh, th this, I, I didn't make this up. I'm, I'm reading a Bible that's just like yours, and Paul wrote this, and he's been saying that this has been a challenge to the church now for thousands of years. Accept one another. So what is the accept? It is to, with welcome arms, say, come on into my space. Now, when you have differences, you either highlight those differences or you simply acknowledge the differences. For some of us, we highlight those differences, and because we highlight those differences, it keeps us from having unity. You're not going to help me here, uh, but that's the truth. If, if I'm more focused on being a woman than I am on, 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 on our unity, I will raise up that I'm not like you. If I'm more focused on being old than you are being young, then I will, I will raise up our differences and use that as a reason to not accept a person into my space. I don't know if y'all not talking back to me because you're thinking about your behavior or you are, uh, you just don't want to hear what I'm talking about. I don't know why you're not talking back to me, but uh, I, I'm going to talk anyway. Uh, so for some of us, we stiff arm people and we will not let them be part of us. And here's what Paul is saying to them. You cannot be the church of God when you will not let people into your space. You ain't really thinking about no unity when you won't let people into your space. And some of you, you're going to have to think about this now because you are efficient, might even say proficient, at excluding people from your life. Don't nobody cut folks off better than you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you push people out and lock the door, and you got five locks on the door. <laughs> Carol Brady and her three daughters had to accept Mike Brady and his three sons. And together with them accepting one another, they become this lovely family because they learn how to accept one another. It's, can I tell you this? It's not a one-way street. 
if I'm going to accept you, that means you have to accept me. And here's what some folks want to do. You have to accept me as I am, but I don't make any accommodations for who you are. No, the text says, accept one another. So if I can deal with you loud, um, it accepts both ways. Some of us live on one-way streets, and we treat our relationships like one-way streets. No, the, the, the traffic now has to go in both directions. You're, you're accepting me, and, and I'm accepting you. As a new pastor coming into Southern Friendship two years ago, this church had a decision. He's coming, but am I going to accept him? Because some folks can say, you the pastor at this church, but you ain't my pastor. You could. I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all, listen, I've been in this for a minute now, and folks don't have to accept you. That's your choice on whether or not you're going to accept a person into your life or you're going to let them into your space. Here's what you can't do. You cannot, you cannot bar somebody from your space and then act like they got a problem with you. You know, some folks, they, they do things, but then they rewrite the story. Y'all know them folks? Uh, they, 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 they've been rotten towards you, but when they tell the story, that's not how it got told. Uh, unity only happens when both sides are agreeing to accept one another. And when both sides are agreeing to keep on accepting one another day after day, week after week, month after month, we have an opportunity now to have unity. But this is keep on. So it's not just that I did it two years ago. I still agree to accept you into my space and to let you into my space, and I'm gonna come into your space. So here's a question all of us need to ask ourselves, do I lovingly accept people into my circle? Or do I violate the code of Romans 15, seven? Accepting one another is what to do. Next, we're going to look at who to accept. The what is let people into your space and keep on letting people into your space. But the second thing is who to accept. We are expected to accept people, to accept people into our spaces. That is to welcome them with open arms. But who am I to accept? You are to accept who Jesus has accepted. I'm, I'm in the text. It's right there in, 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 in Romans 15, 7. He's, he said, if, if Jesus has accepted them, then you accept them. Can I give it to you another way? If they have accepted Jesus, then you ought to accept them. If, if they have named Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they have declared that I'm a sinner and I am in need of the righteousness and the grace and the mercy that comes from God, and, and if they've done what you've done, they, they've been naked, wounded, and sad, standing at the foot of the cross the same way you stood at the foot of the cross pleading for mercy. How can we not accept them? I'll tell you how we not accept folks. It's because we act like we didn't have to stand at the foot of the cross begging for mercy. 
But when I had to stand there and say, Lord, forgive me for all the wrong I've done. I don't have a right now to reject someone that Christ has accepted and who has accepted Christ. When they have accepted Christ, and they're saying, for God, I'm going to live. For God, I'm going to die to who I was, and I now live the rest of my life as a soldier of Jesus Christ. How do we reject them? When they've declared that I want to be a member of the church that you go to, the member that you, the, the church that you have become a member, I too want to be a member of that church. That's who you accept. You, you accept them with welcome arms. You open your arms wide and say, come on into the house of the Lord. Why should a person come to the house of God and feel rejected? Who gives us the right to reject somebody when you've been accepted? I know it was a long time since you did what you did. But you did it. And how long it's been since you did it is not relevant. The issue is that all of us at some point had a reason to be excluded from the house of God. I know you got it all together now. I know you know how to put your pumps on and you know how to tie your tie and wear your suit and you look like you've always been squeaky clean all your life. But the truth of the matter is there should have been a time when you were excluded. Can I tell you this too? That those who are coming in because it's accept one another. So those coming in have to come in accepting those who are already here. It ain't, it ain't a one-way street. It's not all the existing members bending over backwards for the new members. It's not all the new members bending over backwards for the existing members. It is learning how to accept one another. I'm going to let you into my space and you will let me into your space. as we accept one another. That's how you become a church that is unified. Now, can I tell you this, that anyone who is refusing to accept other people into your church, you are violating the code. You're violating the code. You, you, you have no excuse for rejecting a person that Christ has accepted. Because what you really have to ask yourself is, am I greater than Christ? Uh, I'm going to deal with this again in a second. But, but how do I dismiss, refuse to have wide open arms to a person that Christ says, I got wide open arms for? Uh, anyone who is refusing to accept people into this spiritual family, here's what they're really saying, is I could not care less about unity. I, I couldn't care less that I'm tearing up my church. I couldn't care less that the cliques and the division and the divisiveness that's happening, I couldn't care less that that's a result of me. I don't care. But I'm going to reject you. And I believe that there's going to be hell to pay for that. When God is all about unity, that I'm an agent of division. When God is about bringing people together, that I'm the agent of dividing people and separating people and conquering people. I think God's going to say, how did you come to my church? If no one, on a, if no one at, at, at the church you go to knows you at a personal level, 
you have not embraced accepting one another. No one at your church has ever had dinner with you. Y'all have never met at the Starbucks to have a cup of coffee and a real conversation with each other. Because you slip in after service starts. And you slip out as fast as it's over with. Uh, that, that's not what acceptance looked like. I did tell you I was talking to you. Uh, I, I just want you to know I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking to nobody else. I'm talking to you. Um, some people have been in church and have never taken the time to introduce themselves to newcomers. Now, imagine, I know you've been in the church since 1974. I know, I know you've been in for a minute. Uh, but imagine what it feels like to be a newcomer coming into the church and folks see you coming and won't take the time to say, welcome to our church. I'm grateful to see you here. What's your name? My name is, I look forward to seeing you next week. That's what it looks like to accept a person. Folks are trying to get acquainted with you, but you stiff arm them. They smile. Hey, how you, how you doing? What's your name? Uh, John. John, well, uh, well, I'm Frank. It's good, good to meet you, John. All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, when you come to a church, you're accepting the people at that church. And you're allowing them to accept you. So we accept the who is those who have accepted Christ and who have come to be a part of our local church. So do I open up? Here's a question that I ask myself. Do I open up and accept the people that Christ have accepted? Those that he has said, come on in. I said, well, you can come on in, but you stay over there. Is that me? Or do I have wide open arms saying, come on in? Can I give you all an example of what it means? I don't have a seat in here. I sit wherever there's an open chair. So how dare you come in here and you got a seat? I'm the pastor and I don't have a seat. And when somebody sits in your seat, um, is this making sense? Then, then it ought to be then that, that we can have someone who's saying, hey, how are you? The last thing I want to do is make you feel like you've done something wrong because you sit where I might normally sit. We've talked about what, we've talked about who, now we're going to talk about how. How to accept one another. That's the third thing I want you to see, and that is we're, we're instructed to accept one another, look at this, as Christ has accepted us. And that's heavy. Because uh, you can't accept people the way you want to accept it. It's got to be consistent with what Christ has done in accepting us. Now, uh, he must live and perform in a manner that is consistent with what we see Jesus do. Now, can, can I show y'all what Jesus did? Look at Romans chapter 14 at verse 1. This ain't going to come on the screen. That's why I want you to have your Bible open. Look at, look at Romans chapter 14. At verse 1, it says, accept those whose faith is weak. Uh, that, that means now, Jesus accepts those whose faith is weak. In other words, they don't have to be on my level for me to let them into my space. 
would you, would you slide from verse 14, 1 down to verse 3 in chapter 14? Here's, here's, what, here's what he wants us to recognize is he says, do not judge one another for God has accepted them. If you look at verse 3, he says, God has accepted them. So if God is accepting them, why do you put your mouth on them? Why do you have so much to say about the folks that God, he knows they're weak. He knows they have issues. But the truth is, none of us could have come to church. None of us could have come to Christ. I, I know you cleaned up now. And you look like you ain't never done nothing wrong. I, I know what you look like now. But the truth is, when you came, yeah, you had a weed habit. Yeah, you, you, had, you, had, you had some other drugs. You had some stuff that you kept undercover. You kept covered up real good. Y'all not going to help me in here. Uh, I don't know why y'all acting like me and Clarice the only one that had issues when we came to Jesus. Uh, I came to Jesus with a whole bunch of issues and God accepted me even with my issues because I'm saying, God, if you'll accept me, I want to come to you. I'm trifling, but I want to come to you. I fall down, but I want to come to you. And he's saying, come on. So if you make up in your mind, I'm only accepting those who are the righteous. I'm only accepting those who dot every I, who cross every T, who leave periods at the end of every sentence. Them are the only people that I want to, you, you will never get to accepting people. Yeah, he's got issues, but I accept him because that's what Christ did. Romans chapter 5 at verse 6, he says, Jesus accepted the weak. He accepted the ungodly. Those of us who were weak, who were powerless, he accepted us. Here's what the text says, is that while we were weak, while we were powerless, Christ died for us. Uh, I, I don't know how much more acceptance you need if when you're weak, he dies for you. If while you're ungodly, he dies for you, he has accepted you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So if Christ is willing to put his life on the line for those that he would identify as sinners. What are you tripping on accepting the people of God? Hope you're still there in Romans chapter 5. Let's slide down to verse 10. Here it is. While we were enemies, he accepted us. I don't accept enemies. Y'all pray for me. Because that's what Jesus did, though. He accepted us while we were enemies. So when you sign up to accept one another, know this, that you are signing up to accept people who have flaws, who are not perfect. Because when they accept you, quiet is as kept. You're not perfect either. Yeah. That's what relationships are about. I accept you with your flaws, and you accept me with my flaws. Hopefully, I don't have a long list of flaws, and then I call myself tolerating you with a short list of flaws. That's what some folks do. In their mind, they have 20-20 vision when it comes to looking at themselves. They got cataracts when it comes to looking at other folks. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They, they can see everybody else's issues. Here's, here's what you and I have to deal with. If Christ can accept those who are weak, 
He can accept those who are powerless. He can accept those who are flawed, who are enemies, and, and who are sinners. You and I have to do the same thing. Here's the greatness of the love of God, is that even when we were flawed, he demonstrates his love to us. He doesn't go in that background, go, you were a drug addict. It goes, but you're coming to me, come on. I know you were a fornicator, but come on. I know you got all this stuff going on in your past, but come on. Here's what I'm really telling you. Those who have selective acceptance are violating the code. There's some folks who, you remember uh, at, at the uh, Walmart, they would have the DVD bin, and uh, the movies would be like $3, $4 for the DVD, and uh, you would have to dig through the DVD bin trying to figure out if it was a movie in there that, that was a good deal, you were finding a DVD and you were digging through it trying to find a good movie for a cheap price. There's some of us who dig through acceptance like we're picking, like, uh, no, I'm not gonna accept you, but let me see if I can find somebody else in here who don't have a whole bunch of issues and I'm going to accept them. That's not acceptance. <laughs> Folks are accepting others as Christ accepted. They accept those, catch this, who have almost nothing to offer. Can I make this real plain? When Christ accepted you, you didn't have anything to offer him. You're not really accepting people if you only accept those who are on your socioeconomic level. You don't drive what I drive. You can't wear what I wear. And you can't eat where I eat. So you stay on the poor people side of the church. And we're going to stay over here on the bougie people side of the church. See, the context of this is the Jews needed to accept the Gentiles and the Gentiles needed to accept the Jews. And here it is for us, the old must accept the young, and the young must accept the old. Singles must accept the married, the married must accept the singles. And then you can fit yourself in there. Whatever category you fit in, there's somebody who's opposite of you, and you have to accept them. And you have to allow them to accept you. So here's the question that I should ask myself, question you should be asking yourself, is do I pick and choose who I accept? Yeah. This was the last one. Y'all ain't got to worry about it. I'm going to talk about something else next week. I won't be on the one another's next week. This is the last one. Uh, We've looked at what? We've looked at who? We've looked at how? Now we're going to look at why. It's right there in the text. Why do we accept one another? Look at verse 6. Paul says, he tells us to have, in verse 6 he says, to have one heart and one voice to glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot, you cannot skip that part. He says that you all are going to have unity. You're going to have the same heart. You're going to have the same voice that you might bring glory to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's continuing with that theme when he gets to verse 7. In verse 7, he says, in order to bring praise to God. So why are you accepting people when they're not as easy to accept? It ain't got nothing to do with you. It is about bringing glory to God. And if there's anything that gets lost in today's church, it's, it's that 
we lose focus of God. You would think, how in the world do you come to God's church and lose focus of him? But it happens every day that folks come here and it becomes about me. As the pastor, it's my church. As the deacon, it's my deacon board. As the choir, it's my choir. As the usher, it's my usher board. But here it is. He's saying, whatever you do, it ought to be done to the glory of God question that you and I should be asking ourselves, how does God get glory out of what I'm doing? I swear to you, if we were asking ourselves, does God get any glory out of this? Half, 75% of what we are trying to do, we would not be trying to do it because we'd have to admit. Ain't no way for God to get glory out of this. There's no way for God to get glory out of me refusing to speak to people. There's no way for God to get glory out of me purposely being divided. There's no way for God to get glory out of me getting on the phone and calling member after member after member, starting garbage after garbage after God. God can't get no glory out of that. I've been in church now 31 years, and I wish to God that there was a way that we could make a phone not work when people are calling, trying to start foolishness in God's church. God is praised, and he is pleased when he sees his people that he has accepted beginning to follow his example. I've accepted them. I accepted her with her issues. I've accepted him with his issues. And I see them accepting each other with their issues. God is getting praised. Now, people who do church and dominate it by their flesh, they're not concerned about bringing glory to God. Now, you do know there's a difference in following Jesus and doing church. Uh, can I walk slow here? There's some folks that just do church. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They ain't concerned about living righteously. They ain't concerned about none of that stuff. I go to church on Sunday. I do church stuff on Sunday, and that's all I'm about. How do you know that? Because they live their lives inconsistent with Scripture, inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus the Christ. Jesus says that, that if you're going to come to me, you're going to pick up your cross daily, and you're going to follow me. Now, if you're not going to take up your cross, you cannot follow me. You cannot be my disciple Y'all not saying nothing. You cannot be my disciple if you're not going to live in a way that is consistent with who I am. So how do I live as trifling as I can be but do church? It is because I'm not following Jesus. I'm going to come to the church. And I wish somebody would say something to me about myself. All who would be followers of Jesus Christ understand that we must accept one another and we understand that it's the only way for us to be unified. I cannot be unified and I cannot bring God glory if I refuse to be unified. Can I make this personal? As a parent, Think about your children who refuse to be brother and sister. Your son refuses to acknowledge that your other son is his brother. Your daughter refuses to acknowledge that your son is her brother. As a parent, you don't feel good about that. But as a father, um, 
Well, I got one of my children here today. But uh, my children got in some trouble a few years ago. I didn't ask her because I didn't know I was going to tell this story. But, but when they, I'm not going to tell you all what they got in trouble for. But they got in trouble and um, in, a, in a twisted way. This is twisted. Uh, y'all, I don't have another way of telling y'all. But I was proud that when they got in trouble, they got in trouble together. Uh, uh, Frankie, bless his heart, he was falling right behind him. Um, but, but it was like, if, if my sister's about to get in trouble, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there. You understand? God wants to know that his children are together, that we're unified. Now, don't, don't mistake my said. Pastor said, long as we together. <laughs> that ain't what I said. That's not what I said. Uh, come on, because if you with me, then, then it ain't going to be that bad because we together. No, I don't want y'all to be together and going to do wrong. Here's what you should ask yourself, and that is, do I concern myself with bringing glory to God through my relationships with others? Now, for a lot of us, the answer to that is no. The way I handle myself in the body of Christ, I'm not concerned with bringing glory to God. I do what I do, and I couldn't care less about bringing glory to God. Now, I used to be a Washington football team fan. And for all of us that are real football fans, there is an arch rival, or there is a nemesis team that you cannot stand simply because they're the rival of your team. Now, as a Washington football fan, my team was the rival of the Dallas Cowboys. And so whether you were a good football player or not, I didn't care. I don't like nobody who plays for the Cowboys except Deion Sanders makes a trade, not a trade, but signs a contract with my team. Now, I can't stand Dion because he played for the 49ers and then he played for the Cowboys, and I can't stand him, but now I'm in a dilemma. I got a dilemma now because he signed a contract with my team and is wearing the burgundy and gold, and I got a dilemma. Will I continue to treat Deion Sanders like he plays for the Cowboys, or will I recognize that he now wears the burgundy and gold? Can I tell y'all, many of us are still treating people like they still wear the jersey of the other team when in fact they have joined our team. Why are you looking at them like they're on the other team? They are on your team. They are no longer outside of the church. They have come to be a part of God's church. Followers of Jesus all over the world are faced with this dilemma. They got the same choices today. And if the church continues to roll on, we will always be faced with this dilemma. Will I continue to treat people like they're outsiders? And am I willing to be vulnerable? Will I let my guard down to let people in, into my space? And will I do it again even when they've hurt my feelings? Even when there's been a misunderstanding, will I keep on accepting them into my space? Jesus accepted them. Will you? Will you unify with one another? It was one of the sermons I preached. Will you love and honor one another? Will you live in harmony? with one another? Will you belong to one another? Those are questions we must ask. And here's one of my biggest fears as a preacher, as a pastor, is that we, pre we, t we, we treat the preaching as entertainment.
My fear is we enjoy preaching, but we do nothing with it. I walk in, I listen to the preacher work all week long to develop a message. I hear it, and I go home and do none of it. And I come back next week, and I listen to another message, and I'm going to do nothing with that one either. Preacher, go home and pray all week long. Study your Bible, develop a sermon, and come back and entertain me. I'm not going to do nothing with what you said. I just want to hear you. God ain't, he ain't sending us a word. If this series accomplished its goal, there'd be some folks who begin to treat one another better. I'm, 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 I'm finished here, but I'll give you one more illustration. I'm not advocating drug use. I never did drugs. But I'm reminded in the 70s and the 80s what I saw from drug users. They would take some top paper. And they would fold it and crease it. I was around them. I sat with them a lot of times. I watched them put the weed. Back then, we called it reaper. They would fold the top papers, put the weed in the top paper. They would lick the top papers. They would put the joint all the way in their mouth, pull it all the way out their mouth, turn it around, put it all the way back in their mouth, and pull it out again. I would watch them light that joint and pass that joint around. And nobody ever said anything about whose mouth the joint had been in. That's what it means to accept one another. Nobody said you got halitosis. Nobody said your teeth is yellow as the sun. Nobody said your breath stinks. They just simply puffed and passed. That's accepting one another. Now, how is it that folks can be sitting in a circle getting high and have more acceptance of one another than what we find in the house of God? There's something wrong when folks can sit around and get high and accept one another, but I can't accept that person who has come to Jesus with his whole heart. I'm done. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you real good. But there ought to be some love coming from Southern friendship like we have never seen before. There ought to be acceptance of one another like we've never seen before. There ought to be folks saying, I used to be beefing with you, but I'm not beefing anymore because you're my brother in Christ. Here's, here's what you should do. You're going to ask God, Lord, is there somebody that I've rejected that I really have not been trying to admit that I've rejected? But low-key, God, you saw me. You've seen me rejected. Some of you are like I am, and you know rejection when you see it. But you're tough, and you don't care. So you've learned to live with folks rejecting you. Amen. I know as the father of the family that the children were going to be mad with some of my decisions. And when they didn't speak to me, just like, well, 
I guess when your punishment is over with, you'll, you'll get over it, but I'm still going to be the daddy of the house. Uh, when I was the owner of the company, there were times when the staff, as long as their check was right, they didn't want to talk to me. Give me my check on Tuesday, all my coins that where they supposed to be, I don't, we ain't, ain't got to be friends. And so I got used to that as the owner, as the pastor. I got used to folks not speaking to me. Uh, but here it is. That's not normal. And I want to say to you that even if you're tough, open yourself up to allow you to give people access where you might have banned and locked the door on some folks. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. All right, you might be here, might be online, you, you are ready to accept Jesus. You, you, you might be that person who's saying, no, I've never accepted Jesus. I've never said, Lord, I'm ready to be a part of, of your church. I'm ready to walk with you in holiness and purity. And this is your opportunity before you begin to accept one another to accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Here's why I would do that. I would do that because for the wages of sin is death. When I've done wrong, I get to die. And Jesus has come that I not have death, but that I might have life, and that I would have life abundantly and full. And so your, your, your purpose for coming might be, Lord, I don't want to spend eternity away from you. I want the fullness that comes from being your son, from being your daughter. If that's you today, I invite you to come. I invite you to come and give your heart to the Lord and let us walk with you, helping you to understand what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. If that's you that's online and you want to make a commitment today to follow the Lord, today I encourage you, put your information in the chat and there will be someone from our church who will follow up with you, even if it doesn't mean coming to our church. We will help you to find a church in your community, in your neighborhood, that will help you to walk with Jesus in unity and in purity. Amen. Can I pray for us before we go? I, I feel a, just a need to pray because uh, I, I don't want this to just be entertainment. This, this, needs to be, this needs to be prayer. So if there's a person sitting next to you who you're comfortable with holding their hand, don't, don't grab anyone's hand without their permission. If they're not comfortable, don't, don't grab their hand. But if you're, you're comfortable with grabbing the hand of the person next to you, uh, I want you to think personally now about this preaching series message from Dr. Russell, message from Minister Grayton uh, about this, uh, the code and how we treat one another. Uh, remember vividly Dr. Russell saying, mind your business. Uh, some of this stuff don't have nothing to do with you. Uh, remember Minister Grayton saying, don't be petty. Uh, maybe there's something out of these sermons, these, this series of sermons that caused you to challenge, they've, they've reached into the nooks and crannies of your heart and have challenged you. So God, we look to you today. For Lord, you know where each and every one of us is. You know where we are. You know, Lord, where our insecurities are. You know about our frailties. You know, Lord, about our struggles of being vulnerable. You know, Lord, how we long not to be taken advantage of. You know, Lord, how we, you, you know, for some of us, we can hold a grudge. The thing that happened was in 76. And I'm still holding on to it now. You know, Lord, that it was five years ago. And I'm, and I'm having a struggle, oh God of letting down my guard and accepting another person based off of what the last person has done. And so, Lord, I pray for your church that we we're having issues with loving one another and embracing one another and being nice and compassionate and concerned for one another. God, I pray that you would meet each of us right where we are. You know our address. You know how to find the way to our hearts. And God, when you look into our hearts, turn the brightest light you have on 
and look down in the nooks and the crannies, the cracks and the crevices of our hearts. And Lord, whatever you find in our hearts that's not like you, we ask you, God, to do corrective surgery, extract it from our hearts. Lord, don't leave us wide open, though, but then stitch us back together that we might heal in healthiness, that we might heal in unity, that we might heal as the true church of God. Church that lives by the code of embracing one another, lives by the code of accepting one another, lives by the code of being united with one another, who lives by the code, God, of doing those things which you have declared the church ought to do. So God, as we go from here, we pray for traveling mercy. We pray, God, that you would help us to get back to Temple Hills, back to Oxen Hill, back, Lord, to Waldorf and to Clinton, back to Silver Spring, back, Lord, to Virginia, back to uh, Arundel County, wherever we're going, God, back to the District of Columbia. As we go back home from this place, we pray your blessing over our lives. Lord, we love you and we honor you and we magnify your holy name. And as a sign, Lord, that we believe you're doing something in our lives and that you're doing something in our church, we hold our heads back and we say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. We lift up our voices and we magnify you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you in advance for what you're getting ready to do. Thank you, Lord, for how you're going to unify our church. Thank you, God, for how you're going to make us stronger, for how you're going to make us more compassionate. Thank you, God, even in advance. To him who was able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority.